Hey guys, it's Bella and welcome back to my channel. I hope you're all having an incredible day. In today's video, we're gonna be covering another case for my 12 days of Christmas. I'm doing a case every day for 12 days until Christmas day. So I really hope you guys are enjoying that and let's just go ahead and jump straight into it. Today, we are gonna be talking about the Hulava murders. They took place on Christmas Eve in 2002. So the Hulava family consisted of Jean Hulava. She was born on the 8th of December in 1959 in Johnstown to Joseph and Maureen Bittman. In 2002, in 2002, when everything went down and this crime took place, she was 43 years old and she was described as a very sweet, nurturing woman. She was known to be super kind and giving and would always go out of her way to help anyone in need, including strangers, and so she decided to pursue a career in the medical field. So she became an x-ray technician and she just wanted to be there and be able to cheer people up who may have been going through a difficult time. She was married to Ernest Oliver Jr., who was born on the 23rd of April in 1960 and in 2000 to he was 42 years old. He owned a trucking company in Pennsylvania and the two got married in the 80s. They had two children together, 15-year-old Elizabeth, who everyone called Lizzie, and 20-year-old Victoria, who everyone called Vicky. And Vicky was also engaged to a man named Jeff Martin, and she also had a nine-month-old daughter named Madison. By December of 2002, Jean and Ernest had separated after over 20 years together, and Jean was not having a good time. She was really going through it, so Vicky decided to move back in with her mother and her sister Izzy, and together they lived in Middlestown in Pennsylvania. Ernest, after the separation, had moved back in with his parents and his 28-year-old brother Scott about 170 kilometers away from Middletown in a place called St. Benedict. Jean and her two daughters were extremely close. She was a super devoted and loving mother and they were just spending as much time as they could together trying to help each other heal and cheer each other up. They were just enjoying each other's company and I guess making the best of a bad situation. And having Vicky's daughter Madison was really helping Jean out. She was obsessed with her granddaughter and it was helping to take her mind off of everything that she was going through. The three women were described as active, social, and they had a lot of fun together. Apparently they were always playing pranks on each other and they just had a good sense of humor. So we're at Christmas Eve now, 24th of December in 2002. Jean, Izzy, Vicky, and Madison were meant to be going to Johnstown, which was about two and a half hours away from Middletown to have Christmas Eve dinner with Jean's parents, Joe, and Mary. It was sort of a tradition. The Hulavas would go there every single year. They would stay over and then the next morning on Christmas morning they would all open presents together. Obviously this year Ernest wouldn't be going like he did every other year because they were separated but unfortunately the four women wouldn't be coming this year either. As it was getting late on the 24th of December they still hadn't arrived and Jean's parents were starting to get worried because I mean she hadn't called them to tell them she was going to be late or that she wasn't coming and they were just really concerned. They thought maybe she'd even gotten in a car accident and they were calling like a bunch of local hospitals and the police to check if she was there or if there'd been any accidents which there hadn't been. They tried calling Jean, she wasn't answering her phone so Jean's mother decided to call the Middletown Police Department and ask them to do a welfare check and to go and visit her house and they basically said look call us back tomorrow if she's still not there, it's Christmas, maybe there are just some traffic delays or whatever and she'll be there later tonight. But Christmas day rolls around and Jean and her daughters still aren't there so Mary calls the Middletown police again and she says please can you just go and do a welfare check on my daughter at her house at the 800 block of North Union Street. So at 7 a.m Sergeant Robert Gilbert from the Middletown Police Department had just started work when he gets a call from dispatch to conduct the welfare check. When he pulls up to the house he doesn't immediately notice anything suspicious or anything out of the ordinary. He knocks at the door, rings the doorbell but nobody answers. So he then goes around to the back of the house which is where he notices that one of the windows of the garage door is broken. He also notices that the family car is still there despite the fact that nobody was answering him when he was knocking on the door and ringing the doorbell. He then knocks on the garage door and it just kind of falls open which is obviously very sketchy. It's unlocked. He announces himself and again nobody answers so he enters the house via the garage door. The garage leads into a little hallway in the house and he goes through the hallway and he comes to the kitchen and that's when he discovers the body of Jean Hulava lying on the ground in a puddle of her own blood. She was cold to the touch and she was dead before Gilva even arrived to the house. So Gilva immediately calls for backup and he and the other officers clear the house and secure the scene before the homicide detectives and the crime scene unit arrive. 
As they're clearing the first floor, they hear a baby's cries from upstairs. So immediately they start heading upstairs with their guns drawn because they don't know if the murderer is still there or not. That's why they're clearing the house. As they go upstairs, they discover the body of Vicky Hulava lying dead on the ground in a puddle of her own blood outside her sister Izzy's room, and she's clutching baby Madison in her arms. As Officer Givler continues to search the upstairs, the rest of the officers take baby Madison downstairs to wait for an ambulance to make sure that she's okay. And when the ambulance arrives, they discover that she's been there for 30 hours in her dead mother's arms. Luckily though, she was mostly okay. She was just a little dehydrated, but she was fine and she made a full recovery. So Gibla is still looking around the upstairs and he goes into the room that Vicky's laying outside of, into Izzy's room. And that's where he sees her lying dead on the bed, again in a pool of her own blood. All three women had been shot with a single shot from a 22 caliber weapon. Jean had been shot in the head and every morning she started work pretty early. So at 4 a.m. every morning, she would be in the kitchen making herself coffee, making herself breakfast. So it was theorized that she was doing exactly that. It was 4am, she was making herself coffee when the murderer came in and shot her, a single shot to the head, killing her. They believe that Vicky was the next victim. She was also shot once in the head. It was theorized that she had been shot while she was crouching over trying to protect her daughter Madison. And because she was shot outside of her sister Izzy's room, it was theorized that she heard the shot downstairs and went over to Izzy's room to try and protect her. Izzy was the last to be murdered and she had been shot once in her left eye and this would have been at really close range because she actually had burn marks around her eye. Police theorize that she had actually tried to grab the barrel of the gun before she was shot because she also had burn marks around her hands. Upon inspection of the house, detectives found that the phone line had actually been cut so it was probably done so that nobody could call for help. They also found that nothing valuable had been taken from the house. This wasn't just like some holiday crime where somebody came in, tried to steal some valuables, tried to steal their Christmas presents. Like this seemed like a very targeted attack on the whole of a woman. Immediately, police start looking into suspects and they're looking at people who are close to the family who know these women because like I said, this was obviously a very targeted attack. It seemed like it was personal and somebody who knew them. As they're questioning neighbors, there's like a few of them that are telling them that they've seen this guy and he's come to the whole of a house quite a few times in the lead up to the murders to visit Jean and there was one neighbor that actually said that he came the day before the murders. So police find out that this is a guy named Stephen Chapman. He was an antique dealer, so he would go and buy people's old stuff and then he would go and sell it at like markets and stuff like that. For some reason, people didn't like what he did. They thought it was weird and they referred to him as like a junk collector or junk dealer or something. And there were also rumors that he and Jean were having an affair. Stephen denied all of these rumors. He said he had a wife that him and his wife were very much in love, they were having no problems in their marriage, and the only reason he was seeing Jean is because she was selling stuff. You know, she was recently divorced, she was trying to get rid of a bunch of Ernest stuff, so that's why he was at the house a bunch. She was actually selling some of Ernest's guns, and people didn't like this again because they were like, look, he's at her house, he's dealing with her guns, and now these three women are dead from gunshots. But he was super cooperative with the police the whole time, he told them everything they needed to know, he let them search his house, House and he was eventually ruled out as a suspect because he had a solid alibi. Another suspect they looked into was actually Madison's father. He was a guy named Francisco Ramos. Back when the couple lived together in Berks County, police had actually been called to the house quite a few times on domestic disturbance calls because they had a very like volatile relationship and they were always yelling at each other and getting into a lot of fights. Originally, Francisco did not believe that Madison was his daughter until he got a paternity test to prove that she was. And some of the research that I did, and we're gonna get into this in a second, I feel like maybe she was seeing him at the same time as she was seeing another guy. And maybe that's why he didn't believe it. I mean, the only way he couldn't believe it is if he thought that she was sleeping with another guy anyway, because otherwise, like, how would she have a baby if it was just them sleeping together? Francisco did have an alibi though. He was apparently about an hour and a half away in a place called Reading, and 
and this was confirmed and he was ruled out as a suspect. They also looked into a guy named Turner Higgins and he was one of Vicky's ex-boyfriends and he's the guy that I was just talking about that I think Vicky was sleeping with at the same time as she was sleeping with Francisco. They had a very on again, off again relationship and they broke up for good and he was having a lot of trouble getting over her and he was making a lot of attempts to try and get back with her and get in contact with her. Now this is the reason I think that they were sleeping together at the same time. I feel like this makes it pretty obvious but basically according to some things that Vicky had told him he was like convinced that Madison was his child. He was super attached to Madison and this is why they looked into him because they were like well maybe that's why he murdered the entire family but not Madison. But at the same time I feel like if that was the case he would have taken Madison instead of just like leaving her there to die. Detectives also found out that he was a locksmith in Middletown so he knew how to like duplicate keys and break into locks and all of that sort of thing. Jean actually had the locks changed for that house after her and Ernest separated and he was the one to do the locks so it's very possible that he could have just duplicated the key so that he would be able to get in. I thought this was like a weird thought path to go down because like if he could get in with a key then why would he just like smash the garage door open? Like police said oh he maybe did this to stage the crime scene but then like what's the point of having the key? Like I feel like him being a locksmith and this particular crime just they don't correlate but I guess detectives wanted to explore every possibility you know? They brought him in for questioning and apparently he was nervous the whole time so they were like okay that's sketchy but he had no criminal history not even a parking ticket he was really cooperative he let them search his place and he also had a really solid alibi so he was ruled out as a suspect and that brings us to Jean's husband Ernest Oliver as I mentioned they were getting a divorce the same year as the murders happened in 2002 after over 20 years of marriage and the reason they were getting a divorce is because Jean found out he had been molesting their two daughters Vicky and Izzy and the day that she found out the day that her daughters told her she was actually amazing about the whole thing she went right up to him she lost her shit on him and she kicked him out immediately which like props to her for doing that no hesitation no ifs ands or buts immediately believing her daughters and saying get out you absolute slime ball so the separation was particularly hard on everyone that's why Vicky moved back in with her mother and her sister and they were spending so much time together because not only was it a separation but it was also finding out that the man that you had loved and been with for over 20 years was molesting your children. Jean obtained an order under the Protection of Abuse Act and got him evicted from the house. He wasn't allowed to come near the house. He wasn't allowed to contact the family. And this also prevented him from possessing or acquiring firearms. She also pressed charges against him and July of 2002, he was taken into custody. At his first hearing for these sexual assault charges, he was granted bail at $100,000. He paid it and he then went to St. Benedict to live with his parents and his 28 year old brother, Scott. Scott said that when Ernest moved back home, he was always really angry and he was always really pissed off at Jean about the separation, which reminds me of this tweet that I saw that said, manipulative people be like, oh, so I'm the bad guy for being the bad guy? <laughs> literally earnest. Apparently he didn't take any responsibility or any blame for his actions. He blamed the whole thing on Jean and Scott said that he said he was so furious that he wanted to shoot her. So they took Ernest in for an interview. He was not cooperative at all. He wouldn't let them search his house, nothing. He also seemed really like emotionless even though his wife and his children had literally been murdered. So like even if it wasn't him, like don't you think he would be sad even though they're going through a divorce? They were together for over 20 years and those are his children. He was just so calm and he never gave them a straight answer. Every time they would ask him a question, he would just respond with another question. He sounds so annoying, but he did happen to have an alibi. He said that he was out hunting with his brother that night and they questioned his brother Scott and Scott confirmed that they were out hunting that night. So they've got no forensic evidence against him. He's got an alibi, but he's sus as heck. So police decide to bring in Scott for another round of questioning and Jean is his sister-in-law. Izzy and Vicky are his nieces, you know, like he, they're family. So police decide to use that to their advantage and they show him photos of the crime scene. They show him photos of Jean, Vicky and Izzy dead in their home. And as soon as Scott sees these, he becomes really emotional and he just starts crying. He starts bawling his eyes out. And then as soon as he gained his composure back, he spilled all the beans. He told them 
everything that happened. So on the night of the 23rd of December, he and Ernest went out to a local bar for drinks. While they're there, Ernest apparently starts trying to convince him to drive him all the way 170 kilometers away to Jean's house so that he can get his dog back. And like I said, he wasn't allowed to contact the family, he wasn't allowed to visit the house, anything like that. So he didn't actually know that the family dog had passed away a few months earlier. Originally, Scott said no, but drink after drink, Ernest kept wearing him down until eventually at midnight, he finally said yes. And they started the drive to Middletown, which is about two, two and a half hours drive away. Like, first of all, so irresponsible for drink driving. But second of all, there is no way on this planet at midnight, my brother could randomly convince me to drive two and a half hours away. And I mean, especially in Scott's case, like you're going to drive your brother who told you he wanted to shoot his wife to his wife's house and his two daughters that he had molested. Make it make sense. Seems like a great idea. Anyway, they had been seen on this drive. They'd been seen um, by some surveillance cameras at a petrol station that they decided to stop at on the way to the house. And then they arrived in Middletown at Jean's house at around 4 a.m. Scott said Ernest made him pull his truck up just down the street from Jean's house and he got into the back, he got dressed into dark clothes, a hunting mask, two pairs of gloves, and he also grabbed his uncle's guns. And Scott just sat there and let him go inside. That's not shady at all. Just, just your casual dog snatching gear, right? Obviously, Scott can't testify to what happened inside the house because he was sitting in the truck waiting for Ernest to come back. But we can assume that Ernest went up to the house, cut the phone lines, went to the garage door and smashed the window in so that he could reach in and unlock it and gain access to the house. He went through the garage, into the house and into the kitchen where Jean was making her morning coffee and he shot her in the head and killed her. He then went upstairs and shot Vicky and then lastly went into Izzy's house. There was a little bit of a struggle there where she tried to grab the gun and he shot her in the left eye. He then headed back to school. Scott's truck and Scott said that Ernest was gone about 10 to 15 minutes and when he got back he was like visibly shaken and really like strung out and nervous. He gets in the car and he just yells at him. He says drive, drive, drive and Scott drives his truck off and they start driving the two and a half hour drive back to St. Benedict. On the way, Ernest gets Scott to stop at a wooded area in Clearfield County and he gets out of the car and just starts getting rid of any evidence. He gets rid of the guns, he gets rid of the clothes he was wearing, the ski mask, the gloves. And then he gets back in the car and he tells Scott this story and he says, repeat the story back to me. If anyone asks you what you were doing, that's the story you tell them. Tell them we were hunting and that's it. So Scott tells the police about all of this. He's super distraught about the whole thing and he agrees to testify against his brother in court. He also took police to the wooded area in Clearfield County where they got rid of all of the evidence. So police had all of that against Ernest now. And he also agrees to plead guilty to first degree murder and burglary charges because he was the one that drove him there. He was the one that helped cover it up. Like these charges are 110% justified in my opinion. There's no way he thought that they were just going to snatch a dog. Especially not after they got there, you know what I mean? At his sentencing trial, his court-appointed defense attorney tried to argue that he'd been verbally abused by his brother and that he felt extreme remorse, but Scott was sentenced to 25 years in prison with the possibility of parole after 12. Now, this case had gotten some media attention and people hated Ernest for obvious reasons. So his defense attorney had the trial moved to a different county so that they would hopefully get a more sympathetic jury pool and wouldn't get all of these people that absolutely hated his guts and had seen him on the news in their jury. He was charged with three counts of first degree murder and his sexual assault charges against his daughters were also consolidated into this one trial. The prosecution was pursuing the death penalty in this case and the trial happened in August of 2004. Scott was obviously their star witness throughout the whole thing. He was distraught during his testimony. He had brought this little handkerchief because he kept breaking down in tears during his testimony and he was like constantly fidgeting with it. He was like really slumped in his chair. Like you could just tell that he was so upset about the whole thing. Whereas his brother was just like completely emotionless and had no remorse. He testified to everything that happened on the 23rd and the 24th of December. And he also testified to the fact that Scott 
Scott had told him that he wanted to shoot Jean before the murders happened. The prosecution also presented several other witnesses that had actually been serving time in prison with Ernest. Their names were Robert Marley, Wilson Televera, James Medley, and also Stephen Stevens, which can I just say, imagine naming your child Stephen Stevens. Come on. These inmates testified to a bunch of different things that Ernest had said while he was in prison, like incriminating things against the victims and also about the crime itself. James Medding specifically testified about the fact that while in prison, Ernest had tried to hire a hitman to go and kill Vicky's ex-boyfriend and Madison's father, Francisco Ramos. So while they were serving time together, Ernest told James about the hitman that he wanted to kill Madison's father, Francisco, and James immediately went and told prison officials. He went and told the authorities. Once James told authorities, they got a DEA agent from West Virginia to pose as a hitman, and he'd been talking to Ernest Ernest and they referred to Francisco as Tank. It was like their code. He told this undercover hitman that he also wanted him to leave a note there saying that he had killed Jean, Izzy and Vicky and then he had committed suicide. And James and the DEA agent testified to all of this in court, so it really just was not looking good for Ernest. The defense tried to turn this around and say, you know, he just wanted to avenge his wife and his children because Francisco killed them, and so he wanted to hire a hitman to kill Francisco to get back at him for murdering his family. Bad Francisco. I mean, it didn't work. Nobody believed him. Everybody knew and assumed that he had just killed his wife because he was pissed off about the divorce and he killed his two daughters because he didn't want them to be able to testify against him in the sexual assault trial. As I mentioned, the gun that Ernest used to murder his family was found when Scott took them to the wooded area and they found all of the evidence, all of the guns and the clothes and all of that sort of thing. So they could confirm that the gun did belong to Ernest's uncle. Unfortunately, the gun had been in the lake some time, so it was quite degraded and they weren't able to match ballistics, but you know, they were able to match it to the uncle. I feel like that was enough. At the end of the trial, Ernest was acquitted of all of the sexual assault charges against him for molesting his daughters because his daughters were murdered. There was nobody there to testify against him. He was, however, convicted to three counts of first-degree murder and was sentenced to death. In January of 2014, though, the Pennsylvania Superior Court actually ruled that these sexual assault charges were going to stay on his criminal arrest record. Something I found so messed up, though, was that after he got convicted, after he got sentenced to death, he actually tried to get Jean's life insurance money. Like, obviously he didn't get it, but the fact that he even tried after murdering her is so messed up. He did appeal his sentence and at the hearing he had a black eye and he said that prison officials had like coerced inmates to come and like beat him up. But the court basically said like, piss off, <laughs> you can't prove this and it's probably not true. So the appeal was denied. And he has tried a bunch of other times to appeal his conviction, but he has been denied every single time. Baby Madison is now a teenager. She's living with her dad and she's apparently a lot like her mum. She loves music, she loves dance, and apparently her family have said she is reminded of how much her mother loved her every single day. And that is all of the information that I have for you on this case. As always, I would love to discuss your thoughts in the comments down below with you guys. Thanks for watching and hopefully I will see you in my next video. Bye guys.